Good evening and welcome to Tucker Carlson tonight. Like a lot of actors, Matt Damon has a weakness for silly, fashionable politics. But otherwise, he seems like a decent enough guy, certainly by the standards of the world he lives in. In a business where stars often behave like demanding children, a place where Harvey Weinstein was long considered a moral leader, Matt Damon stands out. He's apparently well-liked by just about everybody he deals with. He gives generously to charity. He's been married to the same woman for a dozen years. They're raising four daughters. No one's ever even accused him of sexual misconduct, but suddenly that doesn't matter. Matt Damon's career is now in jeopardy. More than 20,000 people have signed a petition calling for producers to cut Damon from his latest film. That movie's already been shot, but the petition demands that any evidence of his voice or image be removed from the film in the editing booth. Other people are saying Damon ought to be denied future film roles, and he may well be denied those roles. What exactly did Matt Damon do to so thoroughly destroy his reputation in such short a time? Well, last week, he gave an interview to ABC News about the wave of sex scandals in Hollywood. No, he didn't defend sexual harassment in that interview. He didn't suggest the accusers are lying. He didn't say anything remotely like that, though you'd never know it from the coverage, which in some cases omits any of Damon's direct quotes. So we'll let you decide for yourself what you think of Matt Damon's views. Here's what he actually said to ABC News. I do believe that, that there's a spectrum of behavior, right? Mm -hmm. and, and we're going to have to figure out, like, what, you know, there's a, there's a difference between, you know, patting someone on the butt and rape or child molestation, <laughs> right? Both of those behaviors need to be confronted and eradicated without question, but yeah. they shouldn't be conflated. David went on to say this, we live in this culture of outrage and injury, and we're going to have to correct enough to go, wait a minute, none of us came here perfect. We're in this moment, we're at the moment, and I hope it doesn't stay this way. The clearer signal to men and to younger people is deny it, because if you take responsibility for what you did, your life's going to get ruined. All of that behavior needs to be confronted, but there is a continuum. And on this end of the continuum, where you have rape and child molestation or whatever, you know, that's prison. That's criminal behavior, and it needs to be dealt with that way. The other stuff is kind of shameful and gross. I don't know Louis C.K. I've never met him. I'm a fan of his, but I don't imagine he's going to do those things again. You know what I mean? I imagine the price that he has paid at this point is so beyond anything that he... I just think we have to start delineating between what these behaviors are. End quote. There it is. Now, there are a couple of incomplete thoughts in there. There's a line or two your average publicist would advise you against expressing in public. But ask yourself, and be honest, how much of that do you actually disagree with? How much is hateful or immoral or otherwise beyond the pale? None of it? Exactly. There's not a single sentiment in that entire paragraph that's not defensible or that 90% of the American population would find over the top or outrageous. It's all within bounds, or it would have been last year, but because a handful of Twitter users don't like it, the rest of us have to pretend that Matt Damon is somehow guilty of something awful. And if we don't pretend, we may ourselves be seen as collaborators of whatever crimes he supposedly committed and forced to share his punishment. It's terrifying and it's corrupting. This is how reason dies. We're watching it happen. Most of us are too afraid to say anything about it as it happens. Meanwhile, the least reasonable, most extreme voices get louder by the hour. Yesterday, actress Rose McGowan ordered the media to stop using the word alleged when describing claims of sexual misconduct. In other words, everyone accused is guilty. If you deny that, you're guilty too. Weirdly, almost nobody in the media pushed back against Rose McGowan's demand. Before long, they may have to obey her. She has nearly a million Twitter followers. She's calling the shots. Let's just be honest about what's happening. Social media are driving this insanity. They're making mob justice the rule and clear thinking impossible. Large portions of our population, and ironically, they tend to be the best educated portions of the population, are now addicted to outrage, virtue signaling, bandwagoning. Social media did that. It turns out it's not that helpful to know what every famous person in America is thinking at all times. It just makes us all crazy and less content. A few weeks ago, former Facebook president Sean Parker admitted that the website he helped found, Facebook, quote, literally changes your relationship with society and with each other. Parker was right. It is all shredding our social fabric before our eyes. Remember, you have an absolute right to say what you think is true. Other people might not agree with you, but that's okay. It doesn't make either of you evil or mean you ought to be fired from your job. It just means you disagree. 
That has always been true. It was true before smartphones, and no matter what they say on Twitter, it's true now. Joining us now, radio show host Tammy Bruce. So, Tammy, I never thought that I would defend Matt Damon, and I'm not actually really defending Matt Damon. I'm just defending the proposition that you can say something that other people disagree with without being fired for it. And we seem to have lost that. Yeah, indeed. I, look, I also loathe him. He's said some things about the president and about others, which I, which politically I very much disagree with. I don't know him. But he seems to me to be like the blind squirrel here. Every now and then you find a nut. Uh, and he's found one, because he's right. And you're absolutely right in your assessment leading into this. But as a feminist, here's also what I see in this regard. And I've been arguing from the beginning here that we need to be careful, as I saw the, the attempt to conflate uh, guys being jerks with guys who are actual predators yeah. and if and, and the women involved in this and, and the people on the left argue that well we don't want him uh, and others to trivialize uh, the real the ser these serious allegations but you know what really trivial trivializes them Tucker is when you do compare a man let's say calling you beautiful as you walk down the hallway or right. maybe rubbing your back with an act of rape that exactly. trivializes those those survivors what they've been through and, and i think that as most people understand that as as we listen to uh, as you read what what matt damon said and this is now our challenge because this is what the left always does they use a serious issue that people we know it, it has to be dealt with and then write it and then uh, uh, abuse it they go too far it's almost it's like the, the french revolution Pe the people begin to do things simply because they can, and they and they use it for revenge or because they can't stop their rage, and then everybody's going to have to pay. Jodie Foster, I think, said, I saw a headline the other day, that every man over the age of 30 is somewhat culpable for the sexual harassment we now face. I have found in my life it's it's been men who have been most helpful and the most decent to me with women not necessarily being so. So this is an issue of behavior. It's not an issue about men or, 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 or sex, even as we know. It's about control. And I think that uh, unless we get a handle on this and have an honest conversation, uh, you're going to have the left once again uh, uh, shredding an important issue like sexual harassment, and sexual assault, because they don't know, they have no boundary of, of what's important, and then conflating everything and then just simply vomiting their rage out well, on everyone. Exactly. And it yeah. diminishes the experience of people who really have suffered. I mean, exactly. if you lost your legs in an IED and I closed my hand in a car door, and I say to you, we both kind of suffered in the same way, you would say, right. no, actually, I have my legs blown off. You broke a yeah. finger. They're not the same. Yeah. And, and, and look, there are different things in the workplace and the seriousness. Workplaces clearly are dealing with that. But we do have to be careful with single voices who have perhaps originally some very important things to say. Right. And then something changes in that framework because they should not be conflated. These things are different. There is a continuum. And, and certain voices, hopefully voices like ours, will remind people of these things and make sure that we don't have a wholesale, uh, 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 effectively a, a, a beheading of everyone who uh, the left doesn't like or that feminists don't like, because then we're all going to lose. That's exactly right. Let reasonable people speak. Tammy, you are a reasonable person. Thank you, Thank you sir. for doing that. Appreciate it. Dr. Carol Lieberman is a psychiatrist and a frequent expert witness uh, in sexual harassment cases, and she joins us tonight. Uh, doctor, thanks all for coming on. Thank you. So we're, we're, things are moving really quickly in our attitudes collectively about sexual harassment, sexual assault. Um, what's the downside to this, potentially? Hmm. Uh, everything is really out of control. This has become such a bandwagon. Now, certainly there are a lot of women who have been sexually harassed, yeah. have been sexually abused. Uh, you know, a lot of these things are, are valid. But I think the problem is that there are some women who have joined this bandwagon who have not been sexually harassed or abused, but who are angry at men for their own personal reasons and have extended this way beyond what the original concept was. I mean, we're now going into the American values of free speech and presumed innocent. You can't have that anymore. People are being tried in the media because of these allegations. I mean, now you're not even supposed to say allegation. I mean, that is absurd. And I mean, so Matt Damon, 
you know, here um, he's a, a because he was connected in some way to Harvey Weinstein because he didn't speak out against him. Uh, now people are going after him because he's a friend or right. a coworker. I mean, where does this end? It's it's like 1984 and it's eroding our trust. Uh, men and women, you know, for women to have power, it's not to be like men uh, or to make we men uh, feminized. You know, to make them to take away their power to castrate them. I mean, that's a Essentially, what's happening? Um, it, it's it's better to be able to work together in an environment, share both of the the things that each one has that can sh that can add to the other. It's not about. I mean, yes, certainly women deserve. The, there's been pay discrepancies and all these kinds of things. These are true, but to go about it in this mass hysteria kind of way and to take away things that we really need to rely on, as I said, like presumed innocent and right. free speech. It's just going way beyond what well, this terrifying. calls for. But you, I also suspect in ways I can't completely articulate that some of the victims in this are going to be women down the line. Yes. Um, you know, this is not... <laughs> People are not looking, women are not looking at this for the long term. Right. Uh, there is going to be uh, effects, you know, women are getting, going to be hired less because men are going to be afraid uh, that they're going to accuse them of sexual harassment. Um, really, what is even more powerful is if we're not allowed to hug or flirt or, I mean, the, the relationship, the love relationship, and I'm not saying that uh, a harasser and a, uh, a victim, you know, that it's, that's a love relationship, but, you right. know, a love has actually been under fire now for a while. I mean, there's no dating anymore. People are going to websites, internet, and so on. F no flirting. I mean, w we're really losing a lot of what is good or was good it between sure the seems relationship in the... Re and we're not pausing to think and of the consequences, unfortunately. Dr. Lieberman, thank exactly. you. I appreciate your insight. Thanks. Thank you. Lawmakers demanding answers tonight about why the Obama administration appeared to protect the terror group Hezbollah. We'll talk to someone who says the story is not a big deal. It's made up. Stay tuned. In a bid for a nuclear deal with Iran, the Obama administration reportedly allowed the terror group Hezbollah to smuggle massive amounts, tons of cocaine, into the United States. It was a stunning decision. Some congressional Republicans are demanding answers. Yesterday, two of them sent a letter to the Department of Justice demanding all documents they might have about this question. Many Democrats, meanwhile, argue this is both old news and a distraction, and by the way, untrue. Richard Goodstein advised both of Hillary Clinton's presidential campaigns. He joins us tonight. Richard, thanks for coming up. Sure. Happy to be so here. So here you have a piece written in Politico. It's a liberal publication, author probably liberal, uh, quoting uh, a number of people interviewing dozens of Obama administration employees uh, at Treasury and DEA who said, in some cases on the record to testimony before Congress, that the Obama people slowed down the investigation to get the Iran deal. Why would they all lie about that? Mm. Well, a uh, couple things, just as a predicate. This smells like Benghazi, which is to say it's a much ado, indeed, a lot to do about nothing, ultimately. The answer to your question is that the people who were name sources, see, why would they do it? Because they had a bias, which is to say they never liked the Iran deal uh, from, from uh, word go. Um, and the people who later were asked to comment about the story from John Brennan on down, they said there was nothing to this. They, John I, they, Brennan? Well, I'm just well, saying. John, you mean the guy on, who's always jumping around on Twitter? I'm, no, okay, I'm saying no. the guy John who's John Brennan is CIA, not a credible, okay. Uh, uh, John Brennan is a ludicrous figure. So well, let me just, and you'll read his Twitter feed if you don't believe me. But I want to get back to the, the motive here. So the author, again, for Politico, liberal publication, yeah. supported the Obama administration all eight years, pretty consistently, interviewed Obama employees who said, not that they didn't like the Iran deal, maybe they they didn't like it. There are reasons not to like it. But very specifically, the Obama people tried to squelch Operation Cassandra, uh, an investigation, an operation designed to stop Hezbollah drug dealing in the Americas. Why would they lie about that? Well, Why I don't know that they did lie, because if you look at the story, everything's kind of qualified, right? They talk about what might have happened, what could have happened. They talk about the fact that, well, 
the Czech Republic could have been pressured to do more to release somebody. I mean, it's, it's one qualifier after another, and I think that speaks to the fact that those people who spoke, again, not for attribution, didn't really know. And the people who did know weren't interviewed uh, for the record. Well, it's the people who ran the program were quoted, who ran the DEA program, who said, look, we had them, and because the Obama people wanted to get this Iran deal, they made us pull back, and tons of cocaine wound up in circulation in the United States. It just doesn't, I mean, it'd be one thing if it was, oh, you know, the Koch brothers are alleging something, right. or some longtime enemy of the Obama people, but these are Obama's own employees, dozens of them. It's just hard to see their motive for lying well, about you say this. Obama's, I mean, these were people who worked in the for, federal government for, when no, Barack Obama was president. In the agencies, their boss was Barack Obama. I His picture hung in their office. You've got thousands of, of federal employees now. Correct. Are they Trump's people when they're not going along with the program? Well, it's like 80% of federal employees vote Democrats. So I, I don't think they were, you know, probably not a lot of right-wingers, no, right? My, my point is, they had an agenda. They didn't like the Iran deal. And I think that they're now kind of trying to get their, their uh, rocks off by trying to kind of talk to this reporter to talk it down. Uh, let me say two other things. So they're lying. Well, let, these let are, all these people are lying about the same thing, yeah. is what you're saying. Let, let Why me, not just criticize the Iran deal? Wouldn't that be easier? Well, they, they should be doing that if that's what they thought. A, there was been no war with Hezbollah, just parenthetically, since 2006. Right. And the Iranians do not have a nuclear weapon. Again, I'm, I don't think there's a connection. I believe these very senior people from the Obama administration, who have, since the publication of this Politico story, said there's nothing to it in the most vehement terms that they can. Well, because it's horrifying and it reflects so poorly on them. But it doesn't answer the question in the specifics. So the piece says specifically. Hezbollah's main arms dealer was nabbed by an Eastern European government. The United States could have extradited him, but chose not to because it didn't want to queer the deal. It actually doesn't say that. What it says is that they didn't put sufficient pressure on. And in fact, as a factual matter, the U.S. condemned the Czech Republic for not releasing this guy. So, But we didn't know, get him. I mean, we condemn all well, kinds uh, of things all the time. And look, this is just the allegation, and the guy is back in Beirut selling arms. Right. So somehow to attribute that to Barack Obama because the Czech Republic held a guy that they wouldn't release to the United States and that ultimately they did release into his own, somehow or other, that, again, that's does, Benghazi does it, stuff. Does it, it's well, Benghazi stuff. I don't know. Stuff. I mean, look, I don't want to address Benghazi because it's an entirely different story and a different fact set. But this piece alleges that tons of cocaine made it into this country, and the Obama administration knew, the DEA knew it was coming into the country. I mean, that doesn't there seem to be much debate about that. Well, I, that seems like a big deal to me, given the the toll that drugs have taken on the country in the last 10 years. Right. I mean, nuclear weapons would take a much bigger toll on the world. OK, I, I, again, I don't subscribe okay, to the so notion. It is a trade off. Well, you're saying no, that that's I, I, I don't subscribe. More people to die the of premise. drugs here, but we got the I, I, I don't subscribe. No. And, and there would be people that dying who are United right. States citizens. I don't subscribe to the premise of the article. But the fact of the matter is, I think if it were true, it still was a deal that was worth it. Ah, you just proved the premise of the article. But thank you, Richard. I My appreciate pleasure. it. Well, despite a 50,000-word piece in Politico kind of nailing the Hezbollah story, a story with major implications, no one's really paid attention in the press. Where has, was it reprinted on the front page of the New York Times? No. Are they talking about it on other morning shows? No. Why is that? Joe Concha pays close attention to the media. He writes about it for The Hill. He joins us tonight. Joe, this seems like, and I, you know, far be it for me to tout anything Politico does. I'm not a fan. But this piece seemed like something that was hard to ignore, and yet it's being ignored. Why is that? Well, usually in these cases, it's looked as when a story isn't reported, oh, it comes from a right-wing outlet, and therefore we're going to dismiss it. As you said, Politico is not exactly a sentiment of or a bastion of conservative sentiment. So that's right. out. Then we look at this as being a 14,000-word piece that this reporter, Josh Meyer, worked on for months. And Obama administration officials, the ones pushing back on this now, loyalists, all were asked to comment on the story, and they wouldn't before the publication. They pushed back on it afterwards. They can't cite specific facts that are wrong with it, just the overall thrust. So certainly that's one thing. And look, if we played a game of PU, okay, Parallel Universe, an appropriate acronym, and you took out President Obama and Hezbollah, and you inserted President Trump and Russia, how much coverage do you think this would get? I'm guessing you would need 30 hours in your broadcast day just to cover this. But instead, ABC, CBS, NBC, the nightly newscast, and that's the best gauge to use in these situations in terms of coverage, 
all did not cover this story. It demands to be covered more, digged into more, since both sides are disputing it. But there's certainly a lot here based on how meticulous this reporter was, which, by the way, he had, as you noted before, not the unnamed sources that could be political operatives with an agenda, and it could be hearsay. He had named sources on the record, documents on the record, things we did not see, say, with the Brian Ross report when he said that President Trump had ordered Michael Flynn to talk to the Russians when in, uh, during the campaign, when, in fact, that happened during the transition. That was based on one flimsy source, no right. checks and balances, and rushed to the air. Do, so, do, do you think part of it has to do with the fact this was is also a drug story. And the people dying of drug ODs and drug addiction in this country, more than 60,000 of them last year, are mostly in the middle of the country. That's not happening in the neighborhoods that media people live in. That story is, I mean, it, it, it's actually lowered life expectancy for middle America. How often is that even covered? Middle America, uh, in the press? New Hampshire, New Jersey, right. where I live, the opioid crisis, the drug crisis that's happened in this America, in this country, is vastly underreported as well. Because again, it ain't sexy. It's not sexy just like the economy isn't sexy, just like the ISIS caliphate being destroyed isn't sexy, right. just like all of these things, tax reform isn't yep. sexy. Instead, we concentrate on Russia. There are three investigations going. Going on. I'm not saying don't cover it. I'm not saying there isn't a story there, but we are overwhelmed in one direction totally and we're missing agree. the important stuff. Yeah, that Americans are dying, that seems like a big deal to me. Joe, thank you. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Mm -hmm. Democrats claim to be the party of a downtrodden working class, but their priorities increasingly seem focused on displacing the working class with immigrants. We'll ask a former Democratic governor, what is the party's future? That's next. Well, for 80 years, the Democratic Party was the party of FDR. It saw itself as a champion of America's working class. In some ways, it was. Today's Democrats feel differently about their constituency. The top priority of the Democratic Party today appears to be mass immigration, the displacement of existing workers here with an unending glut of foreign workers. Many of the Democratic Party argued for a shutdown of the government in pursuit of full DACA amnesty. House Minority Leader Nancy Pelosi even said the parents of Dreamers did, quote, a great thing by breaking our immigration laws. Martin O'Malley was the Democratic governor of Maryland. He recently started a PAC to help down-ballot Democrats. He's going to be one of the people charting the future of the Democratic Party, and he joins us tonight to tell us what it is. Governor, great to see you. Thank you, Tucker. Good to be with you. Thanks for having me. And Merry Christmas. So it, se it seems to me, Merry Christmas, it seems to me that um, the election of Trump opens up you know, a bunch of questions for Democrats. Obvious one is, who are we going to be? Reclaim our place as the party of the middle class or not? I think they could probably do pretty well if they did that. But that's not obvious from the priorities. Why would the Democratic Party put amnesty for DACA recipients at the very top of the list of things to get done at the end of the year? Look, I think the, I think the core of the Democratic Party remains that commitment to that timeless American ideal of opportunity for all. Yep. And were we not a country of immigrants, we would not be the country of creativity, innovation, diversity, which makes us, which makes us such a strong country. So uh, look, the, the Democratic Party believes in the dignity of every person, in the dignity of work. And contrary to some false assertions, there is not a lot of mass immigration going on. I mean, last year, net immigration from Mexico was zero, meaning that as many people left as came No, no, as no. Came no, in. no. The, the, there has been mass immigration for 52 years, and it's completely changed the demographic mix of the country and the population of the country. We have more than a million There's coming legally. Well, right, but not at these levels. We've actually never had levels this high in American history. That's a fact. Oh, yes, and so, my, and by the way, yeah, I'm not arguing the, against immigration. I, I'm just in saying the 1870s, in the 1880s, it, no, the from my higher. It, we have a higher, yeah. a higher proportion now. But here's the point: if you're worried about wages, which are stagnant, and that seems like an obvious right. issue for Democrats and something to be upset about, importing a million low-wage workers every year does not make wages go up. It's just a math question. It doesn't work. So why would they be for that? Yeah, here's the rub, though, uh, Tucker. It's, uh, it's, uh, if you have people in our country already, and these Dream Act kids, the kids covered by DACA, they were brought here at a time when they weren't even of an age of, 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 of reason when they could say whether they wanted to come right. or didn't want to come. So the only country they've known is the United States. What's a real drag on wages? 
is when you force people to live in the shadows of a society, to work off the books, to be exploited because they cannot go to to enforce contracts and they cannot and they're susceptible to being taken advantage of. These are the things that hold hold down wages. When okay, so you're you're saying by an open society by that's giving better for all of us amnesty to people bringing more immigrants in who are coming from countries where the average wage is a third or less than what it is here that will somehow magically make wages in this country go up why hasn't that happened yet if that works no what i'm saying is this what i'm saying is this that these kids are already here they have been here for for years and years the only country they know is the united states right now i get it's a tough situation look it's a tough situation for them but like of all the issues I don't know. How about entitlement cuts or the opioid crisis or things that actually affect middle class America? Why is the one issue they're not going to move on? They'll shut the government down over well, it. 700,000 people here illegally. It just seems like the middle class is not their priority. You see what I'm saying? I, I see what you're saying, but I think you're I think you uh, ascribe to the Democratic Party, uh, you know, a myopic worldview. I mean, these kids are important. The fact that 120 of them are falling out of status every day is also important. But the most we also the Democratic Party was fighting against this. $1.3 trillion tax cut that primarily benefits the wealthy, that isn't needed, that isn't fiscally responsible, that does nothing to make wages go up. The Democratic Party is advocating in states and cities across America for raising the minimum wage, for paying a living wage. Look, uh, we're also advocating for more affordable college, more affordable health care. So, uh, yes, part of that is that we right. care about these kids, these kids whose only country is the United yeah. States of America. No, I know. I the party cares about the part about the kids. Governor, thank you. Thank you. And Merry Christmas. Remember, Jesus was himself a refugee child. What would you do if he came to your border? <laughs> That's so stupid. It's hard to respond. Thank you, though. Meat is tasty, but should we give it up in order to tear down the toxic male cis heteropatriarchy, whatever that is? Our next guest says yes, go vegetarian. And the patriarchy. She joins us after the break. Eating meat is pretty tasty, so it's no surprise that most people do it. You probably do. But are they making a mistake in leaving half the human race enslaved by patriarchy? And Alessio Parson is a sociology professor at Penn State University. She's sitting right next to me on the set right now in a recent piece for something called the Journal of Feminist Geography. Professor Alessio Parson says that eating meat entrenches hegemonic masculinity and that for women going vegetarian, quote, pushes back against the patriarchy and may even eliminate the gender binary itself. Professor Delisio Parson joins us tonight. Professor, Very thanks well for coming on. It. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you. Well so you wrote this in the Journal of Feminist Geography, my issue did not come, uh, so I haven't seen it, but tell me. You I can send you a copy. <laughs> I can't wait. <laughs> so you say that vegetarianism uh, helps women push back against the patriarchy and makes men more egalitarian and respectful. How does that yeah. work? Yeah, I mean, so that's not a direct quote, but that's, that is very well summarized. Okay. Um, so you must have good people working for oh, you. Oh, for sure. <laughs> so what, how, how do you connect eating meat, carnivorous behavior with the patriarchy? Well, I said I brought you a gift, right? Yes. Use your imagination. Okay. And I think this book might help. Okay. Okay. So I read it this year. Have you ever heard of Octavia Butler? No, never. Oh, do you like science fiction? Oh, tons. Yes, you do? Yeah. Okay. So I have a book um, by Octavia Butler called okay. Lilith's Brood. I can't remember. This camera? Lilith's Brood. Okay. Yeah. Um, and that's like a dystopian feminist novel about Oh, men. it's... No, no. No. <laughs> You got to read it. It's to about find carnivores. Out. You got to read it to find okay. out, right? Okay. Well, tell me, how does do you think that being a vegetarian helps defeat the patriarchy? Well, wait first. You gonna read it? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so then Come on. Yeah, of okay. course. Thank you. All right. And this is the one I'm reading. Okay. And for another partial response, check out this one. <laughs> Good. Um, so we've we've sold a couple of feminist books here on the book club. They're not just but feminist. But, they're, but tell me, the let's get to the nub of it. How I eat meat. Yeah. How am I perpetuating the patriarchy by doing so? Well, like, okay. There's a, several ways. Um, one of the ways in which we perpetuate patriarchy is when we take up a little bit too much space. Right. And eating meat is a diet that um, requires more space on the planet. Well, that, okay. okay. 
It requires more resources to produce meat than it does to produce plant-based food. But what does that have to do? I understand that, and I know the environmental so argument one against yeah. eating meat. But you seem to suggest in your piece that there's something about meat specifically that makes men dangerously masculine and that men who refrain from meat become easier to deal with or, as Wait, you put Tucker, it, more you egalitarian. I seem to say in my piece. You said you didn't read it yet. Well, I have the summary right here. Well, you didn't read my words. Well, I think they've got quotation marks around oh, it. Oh, okay. Do you believe huh. that eating meat makes men more masculine? Why are you, um... I guess I'm wondering why you're so concerned about like men becoming more or less masculine. <laughs> I feel like this. Are you really a professor? Because I feel like this may be performance art. <laughs> What's performance? No, no, no. I'm a professor. Okay. I do. I believe though that when you come together, two individuals come together. Right. Um, you co-produce knowledge. Okay. So you were saying before you didn't finish college. You co-produce knowledge. Yes. So you tell me this. If I stopped eating meat, would I, how would I be better? I don't think it's about better or worse. Okay. Right? I think it's a question of how much space are we as individuals taking up. Hmm. So how much space are we taking up when it comes to what we consume? The tea we drink, I really like tea. Um, oh, I had a package for you, I'll give it to you later. Okay. Um, the things Let that me just ask you this really quick. On our body and what we put in our households. How much space do you we take up? You promise you're a real professor? Yeah. What does it mean to be a real professor? <laughs> no, this I is getting, this is getting too deep. I'm going to ask you one last final question, yeah. which is, um, I'm getting the sense from what I have read, whether or not you wrote it is another question, but I think that you did, that yeah. when men stop eating meat, they change in ways that you think are good. Is that true? I think it's helpful that, that men stop, that all people consider how much meat they, ch they choose to put in their bodies. I'm not here to mandate anything, right? right? We all make our individual level choices. Our individual choice is incredibly important, okay. right? Adam Smith. Yes, Adam right? Smith. We were just talking about it in the green room. I will say, I've, so. I come away with two strong impressions from this interview. <laughs> One, I like you more. Really? But I know much less. What does that mean? I don't know. Will you have me it's, back it's to discuss our books? We can talk about. Professor, thank you okay. for joining us. All right. Thank you so much. We can't get enough of those racist trees. We'll try to determine just how many trees need to be cut down before racism ends. Maybe it'll be all of them. We'll tell you next. What does that mean? <laughs>we don't have enough problems in this country the specter of racist trees now haunts america like a demon ever since local officials in palm springs california out there in the desert in the heat identified a group of tamarisk trees at a local golf course as being racist we've been seeing those kinds of trees everywhere is it a coincidence that a pine tree resembles a clansman hood what does the weeping willow weep for if not the end of jim crow are other trees complicit in in all of this, Larry Elder is a radio show host from the state of California. He's a lifelong resident. He's been watching carefully. Larry, what, what's going on out there in Palm Springs? If you could sum it up for us. Uh, I, I think it's climate change. Uh, it, it's, hard, it's hard to say, Tucker. This is California. This is where the governor just signed a measure to hike up the minimum wage to $15 an hour after, say, after saying and admitting that uh, minimum wage measures don't make, quote, much economic sense, close quote. So go figure. It's all about making black people feel better about the past, about Jim Crow, about slavery, as if that's the issue facing black America. A news bulletin for 30 or 40 years, Tucker, blacks score higher on self-esteem tests than do whites and Asians. Uh, the suicide rate for whites is higher than the suicide rate for blacks. The issue is not whether blacks feel good or bad about themselves. The issue is what do we do about that part of black America that is broken, that is not doing well. Right. And the number one problem facing black America has nothing to do with white racism or racist trees. It has to do with the fact that 73 percent of black kids are raised without fathers. And I didn't say it. Obama said a kid raised without a dad is five times more likely to be poor, nine times more likely to drop out of school, and 20 times more likely to end up in jail. So let's talk about what's causing so many women to marry the government and so many men to abandon their financial and moral responsibility. Yeah. That ought to be the conversation, but it isn't. It, it, it never is. In fact, you're scolded for bringing it up, but it's enormously sad. I just find it so interesting, in, uh, growing up in California around liberals, there was really no greater sin than cutting down a tree. I mean, cutting down a tree was immoral. They were called tree huggers, literally. Well, these are 
These are racist trees, though, of course. Uh, and, 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 and Tucker, in California, you have a governor that does not support vouchers. Even though the majority of urban parents, black and brown, want vouchers, the Democratic Party is opposed to vouchers. Yet 95% yeah. of black people pull the lever for the party that, in my opinion, has put an obstacle uh, in front of their kids getting the, an education, which, of course, is the route to the middle class. So go figure. See, I just, look, here's what I want is not everyone to agree with me, but at least to have a conversation about things that actually matter rather than frivolous things. And one of the reasons we've highlighted the racist tree story is because it is so self-evidently stupid that maybe it'll awaken people to the frivolous nature of the conversation. I mean, why aren't we having conversations about test scores and marriage and drug use, not just in the black community, but in every community in America? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, I reminded Don Lemon when I was last on CNN, maybe that's why I was last on, yeah. that in 1997, Time magazine and CNN did a poll of black teens and white teens and asked them both whether or not racism was a major problem in America. And not too surprisingly, both white teens and black teens said yes. But then yeah. they asked black teens, uh, is racism a big problem, a minor problem, or no problem in your own daily lives? And almost 90% of black teens said racism was no problem or a minor problem in my own daily life. In fact, more black teens than white teens said failure to take a advantage of available opportunities was a bigger problem than racism. So what are we talking about? Racist trees? Take a wand and wave it over America and oh, remove no. every smidgen of racism from the hearts of white America. We're still going to have the problem of young people having yep. children they can't take care of, of men abandoning their responsibility, of government schools that don't work, of bad economic policies like minimum wage that destroy jobs, of porous borders where uh, you have Ill illegal workers with yep. unskilled, uh, challenging workers in the inner city, and on and on and on. Those and are the on, problems on, facing on. America. Let's have a conversation. About no, you're right. Things. You're absolutely right. No one says it better than you do. Larry, thank you. Great My to pleasure. see you. Merry Christmas. Senator Elizabeth Warren has been mocked for contributing her family recipes to an American Indian cookbook, but how does her powwow chow actually taste? We investigate it. Coming up.